On February 23, 2022, a woman named Tara Pakanech was stunned by the scenes she witnessed in her basement. The severed head of her son was lying in a bucket with a towel placed on the top. She immediately called 911, and as the officers took in the scene, they were baffled by this inhumane murder. The head belonged to the 24-year-old American man, Shad Tyrion. Where was the rest of his body? Who committed this atrocious crime, and why? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today, we dive into the twisted and disturbing case of Taylor Shabiznes. Allow me to introduce the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin, where Shad Tyrion lived. It's the main city of the Green Bay Metropolitan Statistical Area, which covers Brown, Kewanee, and Oconto counties. Having a population of about 107,000 people, Green Bay is the third largest populous city in Wisconsin. It's popularly known for the National Football League team and also for being the toilet paper capital of the world. Ranked as the number one metro to live in the United States, the city enjoys pleasant weather with a low risk of natural disasters. The city has its fair share of crime, with a crime rate of about 19.76 per thousand residents. It's considered to be more dangerous than 78% of other U.S. neighborhoods. Being a harmonious city, the gory act committed on February 23, 2022, continues to haunt the community. Now let's delve into the life of the victim, Shad Tyrion. Shad Rock Tyrion was born on September 7, 1997 in Green Bay, Wisconsin, to Tara Pakanich and Michael Tyrion. Later, the couple separated, and Tara eventually started dating a man named Steve. The family consisted of Shad, his parents, his two sisters, Ava Wheelock and Silvea Sunray Tyrion, and his brother, Bo Smith. He was also surrounded by loving paternal and maternal grandparents and many aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends. Shad attended Howard and Swamico schools as a child, but later decided to help out in the family business, along with his father and his grandfather. Shad was a really lively man. He enjoyed camping, gaming, and spending quality time with his family. He was also quite talented and artistic and loved carving wood. Shad was kind and compassionate, often placing others' interests before his own. Being a man with such an empathetic character and a loving family, it makes what happened to him all the more tragic. As evening crept in on February 23, 2022, Shad told his family that he'd be going out to meet with two of his friends. They planned to hang out for the night, and his parents bid him goodbye at around 9.30 p.m. No one could have known the danger he was unknowingly walking into. Shad's mother, Tara, who had gone out for a while, returned a couple hours later. She then headed upstairs to sleep, not knowing that her son had returned home along with Taylor and was in the basement with her. Several hours after midnight, Tara was awoken by the front door being slammed. It was Taylor leaving that startled Tara. She came downstairs and started calling out to her son. Hearing no response, she decided to walk down to the basement. When she entered the basement, however, she noticed a bucket with a rag lying on top of it. Curious, she removed the rag and was met with a horrifying sight. Her son's severed head was inside the bucket. She immediately called 911. Are you positive my son's head is in a bucket? I don't know if it's in my basement. What, mean, what, what makes you think that? Because I looked in the bucket. When, what did you see? Exactly what I told you. When officers arrived at Tara's residence on Stony Brook Lane in Green Bay, Wisconsin, they began securing the entire house, but when they entered the basement where Shad lived, they were taken aback by the gruesome scene. They knew they needed to find whomever had committed such a savage crime was a potential threat to society as a whole. Hi. Did you both see this? I opened the towel, I picked up the towel, and dropped it because I don't know what the f*** is, man. I have bad vision. She's like, is it? Is that what I think? Is it? I don't know. What the fuck is it? Do you want to stay with those two? I'll just come see you. Yeah. So, Where's the bathroom? Right there. Uh, this Look right. There's a bathroom right there. Look right. There's a bathroom right there. Look right. 
I, uh, I know you're busy over there, but this is actually what it's going to be. It's not going to be a 961 thing or a 96 thing, so we're going to need more units here. Upon further inspection, investigators also found Shad's detached genitalia in the bucket along with his head. Detectives began to analyze Shad's phone call history and discovered that on the evening of February 23rd, Shad had agreed to meet up with two of his friends named Taylor Shaw Business and Alexander Gannon, also known as AJ. On that night at around 9.30 p.m., Taylor came to pick Shad up so that they could hang out in her apartment together, according to the statement given by his mother, Tara. The police immediately went over to question Taylor Shabusness and AJ at their respective houses. Taylor was staying in a house that belonged to a man named Scott Thomas. Scott was Taylor's friend, and the duo stayed at the house together. At Taylor's house, detectives found bloody footprints near Taylor's minivan that led up to her apartment. They decided to take Taylor back to the station for further questioning. Even after being charged for something as gruesome as beheading her ex-lover, Here's Taylor sitting in the interrogation room and complaining about the lack of cleanliness of the place while staring at the camera. This portrayed how Taylor was completely detached from the present with no ounce of guilt for what she did to Shad Tyrion. I hate this office. Never in my life. I don't know The detective got straight to the point and asked her how she knew Shad. Taylor replied that he was her ex-boyfriend. She also admitted that she met with Shad on February 23rd in her apartment where Scott was also present. He was also there when the police arrived to arrest Taylor. She also added that the minivan belonged to Scott. Taylor was questioned about what activities the three friends, she, Shad and AJ, did that night. She readily confessed to smoking weed together. She said that she was giving Shad a haircut while the three of them smoked, but after a while, AJ decided to head home, saying that it was late. After AJ left, Taylor and Shad decided to head to Shad's house, where he told her that his mother and her boyfriend were going to be coming home late. They headed over to Shad's house and smoked ice, which is meth. She also admitted to stealing trazodone from her friend Scott's drawer, and they both shot it up with a needle. Taylor's admission of using drugs that night signified that she probably was into substance abuse, which adds another complex layer to this case. The detective realized that Taylor was under the influence of drugs while they were questioning her, but carried on with the interrogation. Without hesitation, Taylor confessed to Detective Graff that Shad's remains were still in the basement. The detective further pressed her, asking what exactly happened to Shad, but Taylor replied that she blacked out after smoking and drinking for a while. This time, even though Taylor tried to find a way out by trying to lie, she was quick to realize that her tactics weren't working and she had no other option except for confessing. Later in the interview, Taylor admitted that she and Shad had been intimate that night and there were also toys and other props involved, including a choke collar. As the interrogation continued, Detective David questioned her about the chains and other toys that they'd found at the scene. Taylor admits that she loved to strangle Shad and he enjoyed it too. This shows her sadistic and violent nature. All right, so you like being strangled, like having it through your airway, or do you like doing it to somebody else? I like doing it to somebody else. Does she have like to be strangled? I think so. Have you done it before? Yeah, yeah. yeah, he does. He likes it. When the detective continued asking Taylor where the other body parts were, she displayed a hint of regret for not bringing Shad's head with her. Taylor wasn't remorseful for what she did. Instead, she was dejected because of the mistakes she'd made when she left Shad's head in his basement that eventually led the police to her. She gave clear answers to the detective, saying that some parts of Shad were inside the van while the others lie in the basement. Her lack of remorse after committing such an atrocious crime was startling. How did you just know where his body was? With what? Knives, 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 knives. Knives? Just more than one knife? Not more. Where'd you get those from? Kitchen. 
Do you want to share it? No, no. It was alright. Bread knife works good. Bread knife? A bread knife works good, yeah. Really? I was like, it was so like, yeah. I got lazy last night, so. Where, where would these knives be now? They're in, they're in with all the organs and all the body parts. And where was that? In the black bag. It's in the black bag. And, um, so we're going to take the hit somewhere? I like that. You liked it? Well, you're gonna have fun trying to look for all the organs, so yeah, they're, they're all dismembered. This might stem from a disturbed psyche, a potential mental health condition hindering her ability to experience any emotions related to this atrocious crime. Another possibility is that she may have been under the influence of drugs, prompting her to act on intrusive thoughts. But the detectives were yet to find out the whole truth. During the interrogation, she frequently giggled and laughed while giving the details of what happened that night. Are you starting to remember now what happened with Shep? Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, what do you remember some talk about? Um, here comes the chain, right? And then you put it around his neck while we were, like, playing around and shit. And then, um, I don't know how to... This once again shows that Taylor didn't understand the gravity of her actions when she savagely dismembered her ex-lover. The detective saw her brutal and sadistic side when she said that she loved watching Shad's internal organs as she dismembered him with kitchen knives. She also added in almost a boring tone that she got lazy that night and didn't bother dismembering and moving all the body parts to her apartment. Taylor's casual behavior and detachment from the crime she just committed made the detective question whether she wanted Shad dead from the beginning. To this, Taylor answers with a no, but there wasn't any hint of repentance in her voice. She continued to describe the events of the night like she was having a casual conversation with the detective. This slowly started to point the finger towards mental health issues after examining Taylor's behavior. Taylor talked about how she strangled Shad with chains, admitting to have fun during the process and didn't even stop when Shad was struggling. This highlights her cruel, sadistic behavior. Taylor astounded the detectives when she added that even after she found out Chad had passed away, she continued to perform sex on him. As the interrogation proceeded, Taylor went ahead and made a strange statement. She claimed that when she loved something or someone too much, she got an urge to kill it and she often lost control. This proved that when Taylor dismembered Chad, she was completely aware of what she was doing, given that they were making love right before the incident. She also confessed to playing with Shad's body even after he'd been dead for two to three hours, showing necrophiliac tendencies. Taylor also expressed a regret about not taking any drugs after the process, since she knew it would help her calm down. She admitted that she was getting frustrated while dismembering Shad and cleaning the mess she'd created, but she said she liked the process. After the admission of her crime, Taylor briefly diverted the conversation by saying that she messed up and didn't mean for any of those things to happen. Yet, while she reenacted the scene of her strangling Shad that night, she was seen laughing and without any hint of guilt or regret in her voice, a clear sign of a person with a distorted psyche. I knew he was going to die, so... I mean, I didn't, but at the same time, I woke up one. That's bad. I didn't, I didn't know what to do, because, like, he was going to be like, ah, I don't know. You know what I mean? Because, like, I don't know. You liked it? I liked it. It, like, I'm like, fuck. Like, it was, like, I didn't know what to do. It was like, oh, shit, I like it, so. Well, you knew because you didn't want to call the police or ambulance or anything, so. I actually thought about it. I thought about it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I was getting angry. I'm like, mm -hmm. very angry at myself. Because I didn't have a problem. You know? Sucks not having it. When Detective David asked why Taylor didn't call for the police or the ambulance if she truly felt sorry for her actions, Taylor did admit that she thought about it, but she was having irrational thoughts after the murder. During another interrogation, the detective asked Taylor how she dismembered Shad's body, and Taylor proceeded to give a vivid description of the gruesome act that night. Her description of the details was more like as if she was reliving those moments to enjoy the thrill again. I pulled him. 
And then um, his head was hanging off. So, so he was probably laying face up. So yeah. his back was on the bed. His back was on his the bed. His head's partially off the bed. Yeah. Okay. And then um, the tub was like right there. Right. The pail that you had the yeah. head in before? Okay. So basically his head's here and the bucket's right here. Yeah, and then um, from there, uh, I didn't guess who it is. You cut his head off? Yeah. Okay. Did you, after you cut his head off, I know you said you dumped the pail at one point into the shower. In the shower, yeah. Okay. Did you leave the body there for a while to drain into the pail or what? How did it's you? all in the tub, in the blue tub. You found the blue tub, right? I don't know if they, they're slowly going through the scene, so there's a lot of this blood. Did you pull the tub under there? Then? Oh no, I moved the tub like real fast. Oh, so you so you cut the head and pulled the tub under there? No, um, when I was dismembering the yeah. body, yeah. there was, I mean, I'm going like this with a knife, so there's blood going on, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, and then, um, but initially, when you, you cut his head off, there was a pail underneath, correct? Okay, so the head went into the pail, yeah. the blood went into the pail. Did the bu- blood bucket fill all the way up with blood? No. No? Okay. No. Then, did you move him again when you started with the pail? Because you're talking about that blue top of water thing. So I think there's a there's a black pail, and then there's a blue top of water thing, right? And then his head was hanging off. And then I cut the head off, and then um, I moved it over, and I brought it back, and then I put it in the pail. Okay, so initially the head went into the blue Tupperware thing, kind of? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of blood in that one right now. In the blue Tupperware thing? Yeah. The organs are everywhere, too. His organs are everywhere? Yeah. Did you, like, hide organs in the house? Oh, they're in, they're in plastic bags. They're in plastic bags. In the tub? In the um, backpacks. In the backpacks? In the backpacks, and then in the... Did you move all organs, like intestines and everything, or yeah. where are the intestines? Do you remember? Um, they're going to be in a plastic bag. They're all in plastic bags. Too. Plastic so that blue tub is almost just all blood, isn't it? I thought you were saying that. It should be like only like this much. Right. Taylor Shabiznis, whose given name was Taylor Denise Coronado was born in Evanston, Illinois in November 1997 to parents Maria and Arturo Coronado. The family moved to Wisconsin when Taylor was in fourth grade. Later in life, she was married to Warren Shabiznis, who was in prison at the time of the incident and also had a two-year-old son named Mateo. Yet despite this, she would indulge in sexual activities with her ex, Shad Tyrion. After the gruesome crime had been committed, the police knew she had major mental problems and desperately needed psychological help but they were sure of the fact that when she committed the crime, she was completely aware of what she was doing since she admitted several times that she loved the act of dismembering Shad's body. She also confessed to playing with him, using the aforementioned toys on Shad's dead body, as well as performing oral sex on him. This deeply disturbed not only the investigators, but all the people around the globe as they started to question the lack of humanity in people like Taylor Shabiznis. Taylor was arrested on February 23, 2022 for murdering and dismembering her ex-lover, Shad Tyrion. On July 24, 2022, the trial of Taylor Shabiznis started. Considering the gravity of the crime, the court had to consider if Taylor was sane during the time of the crime and if she knew what she did was wrong. During the trial, Taylor's grandmother came to give her testimony. She stated that Taylor had a very rough childhood where she lost her mother at an early age and her father remarried. Taylor also lost her brother, Arturo Coronado Jr., in a motorcycle accident in 2021. Her husband, Warren Shabiznis, who also defended her in court, was already in prison for illegally distributing methamphetamine. Her grandmother added that 24 hours after Taylor's son was born, he was taken away by the Child Protective Services, but Taylor's grandmother and her husband were fighting for custody of their grandson, Mateo. Growing up in such a toxic environment, She added that Taylor had dealt with depression and bipolar disorder. She added that Taylor needed psychological help, but also another chance to live her life. Uh, Do you believe that she has good qualities? Yes. What are they? I believe 
I, she's a very caring person and yeah. also very trusting. She, she trusted people that said they care for her and actually always she, she was, uh, what can I say that it, it, she always end up getting hurt because she trusted people thinking they cared, but she's always have had the, the problem that wherever she goes, people just use her and, and, and she thinks they care, but they don't. When Taylor's 51-year-old father, Arturo Coronado, came to give his testimony, he too had to be transported from prison where he was serving a sentence for a second-degree assault of a child. What was disturbing to watch was that the moment he entered the courtroom, Taylor couldn't stop smiling and giggling throughout his testimony. He truthfully gave all the details about Taylor's upbringing, highlighting that she did indeed have some issues back in high school, and as a way to resolve them, her father sent her to her grandparents in Texas where she graduated. He also stated that right before Mateo was born, Taylor was admitted to Nicolet Psychiatric Center since she was hallucinating a lot and was having suicidal thoughts. In the end, he added that Taylor was doing pretty well until her husband came into the picture and got her addicted to drugs. Similarly, when Taylor and Shad's mutual friend, Alexander Gannon, came to testify, Taylor continued to giggle and laugh throughout his testimony. Alexander gave a statement that he'd known Taylor and Shad since they all attended Bellevue Middle School together, also confirming to Taylor and Shad dating back then. He also gave his testimony regarding the day of the murder when they were all drinking at Taylor's apartment and he left at around 1 or 2 a.m. since it was getting late. He further stated that he contacted Chad the next day but got no replies. During her next court appearance, Taylor was seen wearing a spit mask, which is generally used for those who are trying to spit on officers or court personnel. Taylor's second cousin, Valerie, and a few of her distant relatives came forward to give their testimonies that though Taylor needed psychological treatment right now, she should be given another chance at life in the future. Shad's uncle, Kelly Tyrion, delivered a quite emotional statement. He emphasized the point that everyone went through hard times in their lives, but that shouldn't be an excuse to murder someone so brutally, and her mental health issues must not be a reason for her possibility of parole. But to take the cowardly path that you did, and to make other people suffer because you were suffering, is pretty. So that name Taylor business fits you well. And I'm not a praying man, but after Judge Walsh here's sentence you today, I will pray that you meet the same fate as your idolistic Jeffrey Dahmer. So have a good life business. But when it was Shad's father, Michael Tyrion's turn, he made a shocking statement of forgiving Taylor for this act. Taylor, I just wanted to say that uh, I forgive you for what you've done to my son. And, uh, yeah, you made a bad choice, and now you have to live with it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to miss Shad. He, he, was a, he was a wonderful child, too. He, growing up, just mild-mannered and just happy and... And uh, I know you made a bad choice, and and uh, like I said, I forgive you, and and I'm gonna ask the judge if he can, you know, if she can see the streets again sometime, you know. It, it may not be soon, but uh, I believe I believe everybody uh, makes bad choices, and maybe not to the scale, but. Uh, I think there's a lot of hope for you. I think, you know, you can make use of your time and be a better person and uh, do great things, yeah, you know, so. It does no good for me to hate you, you know. Uh, I know, I know you got a heart. I know you got a mind. And uh, I wish you no harm. Finally, the assistant district attorney, Caleb Saunders, concluded that what Taylor did to Shad was not because of substance abuse or her mental health issues. She simply committed the crime because she liked it. 
He added that Taylor's lack of remorse should earn her the highest possible sentence for this gruesome crime. Defense attorney Christopher Froelich said that Taylor was not a lost cause or a monster, and though she committed this irreversible, horrific crime, she should be given another chance. He also labeled this whole murder as an honest mistake. I don't believe that my client <clears throat> is or wanted to do this or liked doing it. I think that she really wasn't able to completely understand or fathom what was going on. And when she was talking to detectives uh, from the Green Bay Police Department, she was still hopped up on drugs. Her mind just wasn't thinking straight. How could it? However, when he asked for a possible extension of the trial, the outburst shown by Taylor in the court gave a clear picture to everyone that she was not just a victim of substance abuse and that she had major issues that needed immediate attention. The trial ended on September 26, 2022, where the judge, Thomas Walsh, sentenced Taylor Shabiznes to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This case stunned the whole world as people were dumbfounded by how inhumanely Taylor dismembered her once lover, Shad Tyrion. What's even more shocking was that there wasn't a hint of remorse or guilt for the gruesome crime that she committed. This raised questions about humanity and society in the present time. Shad's family and friends came together to pray for his soul and spoke about how they'll never be able to heal from this tragic incident. It was also shocking that even after knowing the gravity of the crime committed by Taylor, her family was ready to defend her and blame her upbringing for the crime that she committed. Today's case was truly a disturbing one. It makes one question the lack of humanity and empathy in people like Taylor who can easily dismember a person that once trusted her. It also highlights that strained family relationships and lack of parental guidance in a child's life when they're growing up can indeed create a monster like Taylor Shabiznes. So now we ask you, do you think the act committed by Taylor Shabiznes was purely due to the influence of drugs? Or do you think that she was aware of what she was doing when she was committing the crime? Does the lack of remorse in her behavior and constant playfulness during the trial show psychopathic behavior? Check the link in the description box for the full interrogation of Taylor Shabiznes. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hit that like button, and share our videos. Also, if you have any crime stories that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comment section below. Until the next time, stay safe.